Identifying the Spiritual Sunday. JakeJohnstone19.com here. Creativity. I'm going to go with it anyway. Creativity with a passion or a purpose. To entertain, to motivate, to inspire. Now on to the Whisperer in Darkness. The following is a reading from H.P. Lovecraft. Great Tales of Horror. This tale was written during an unusually extended period from February the 24th to September the 26th, 1930, and its genesis goes back to at least 1927. When Lovecraft first visited Vermont, captivated by the unspoiled beauty of the state, Lovecraft wrote an eloquent essay, Vermont, A First Impression, whole passages of which have been incorporated into the story. The setting of Henry Ackley's farmhouse is a meddling. A melding of the residences of his friends, excuse me, with Brest Wharton and Arthur Goodenough. Lovecraft has definitely included the discovery of the planet Pluto in the text. Its discovery was announced a month after he began writing the tale. It was first published in Weird Tales, August 1931. Excuse me while I drink a little bit of this coffee here. I'll get right into it. Chapter 1. Bear in mind closely that I did not see any actual visual horror at the end. To say that a mental shock was the cause of what I inferred, that last straw which sent me racing out of the lonely Akavay farmhouse and through the wild, doomed hills of Vermont in a commandeered motor at night, is to ignore the plainest facts of my final experience, notwithstanding the deep extent to which I shared the information and speculations of Henry Eckley. The things I saw and heard, and the admitted vividness of the impression produced on me by these things, I cannot prove even now whether I was right or wrong in my hideous interference. For after all, the inference, Akeley's disappearance, establishes nothing. People found nothing amiss in his house despite the bullet marks on the outside and inside. It was just as though he had walked out casually for a ramble in the hills and failed to return. There was not even a sign that a guest had been there, or that those horrible cylinders and machines had been stored in the study, that he had mortally feared the crowded green hills and endless trickle of brooks among which he had been born and reared means nothing at all either for thousands are subject to just such morbid fears eccentricity eccentricity moreover could easily account for his strange acts and apprehensions toward the last the whole matter began so far as i'm concerned with the historic and unprecedented vermont floods of november the third nineteen twenty seven i was then as now an instructor of literature at muscatonic university in arkham massachusetts and an enthusiastic amateur student of new england folklore shortly after the flood Amidst the varied reports of hardship, suffering, and organized relief which filled the press, there appeared certain odd stories of things found floating in some of the swollen rivers, so that many of my friends embarked on curious discussions and appealed to me to shed what light I could on the subject. I felt flattered at having my folklore study taken so seriously, and did what I could to belittle the wild, vague, tales, which seemed so clearly an outgrowth of old rustic superstitions. It amused me to find several persons of education who insisted that some stratum, ah, stratum of obscure, distorted fact might underlie the rumors. The tales thus brought to my notice came mostly through newspaper cuttings. Through one yard had an oral source, and was repeated to a friend of mine in a letter from his mother in Hardwick, Vermont. The type of thing described was essentially the same in all cases, 
though there seem to be three separate instances involved, one connected with the Wunuski River near Montpelier, another attached to the West River in Wyndham County beyond Newfane, and a third centering in the Passumpsic in Caledonia County above Lindenville. Of course, many of the stray items mentioned other instances, but on analysis, they all seem to boil down to these three. In each case, country folk reported seeing one or more very bizarre and disturbing objects in the surging waters that bore down from the unfrequented hills, and there was a widespread tendency to connect these sites with a primitive, half-forgotten cycle of whispered legend which old people resurrected for the occasion. What people thought they saw were organic shapes, not quite like any they had ever seen before. Naturally, there were many human bodies washed along by the streams in that tragic period. The whisperer in darkness. But those who described these strange shapes felt quite sure that they were not human, despite some superficial resemblances in size and general outline. Nor, said the witnesses, could they have been any kind of animal known to Vermont. They were pinkish things about five feet long, with crustaceous bodies bearing best pairs of dorsal fins or membranous wings and several sets of articulated limbs, and with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid covered with multitudes of very short antennae, where a head would ordinarily be, it was really remarkable how closely the reports from different sources tended to coincide. Though the wonder was less lessened by the fact that the old legends shared at one time throughout the hill country furnished a morbidly vivid picture which might well have colored the imaginations of all the witnesses concerned. It was my conclusion that such witnesses, in every case naive and simple backwoods folk, had glimpsed the battered and bloated bodies of human beings or farm animals in the whirling currents, and had allowed the half-remembered folklore to invest these pitiful objects with fantastic attributes, the ancient folklore, while cloudy, evasive, and largely forgotten by the present generation, was of a highly singular character, and obviously reflected the influence of still earlier Indian tales. I knew it well, though I had never been in Vermont, though the exceedingly rare monograph of Eli Davenport, which embraces material orally obtained prior to 1839 among the oldest people of the state. This material, moreover, closely coincided with tales which I had personally heard from elderly rustics in the mountains of New Hampshire. Briefly summarized, it hinted at a hidden race of monstrous beings which lurked somewhere among the remoter hills in the deep woods of the highest peaks and the dark valleys where streams trickle from unknown sources. These beings were seldom glimpsed, but evidences of their presence were reported by those who had ventured farther than usual up the slopes of certain mountains or into certain deep, steep-sided gorges that even the wolves shunned. There were queer footprints or claw prints in the mud of brook margins and barren patches, and curious circles of stones but the grass so brown them worn away, which did not seem to have been placed or entirely shaped by nature. There were two certain caves of problematical depth in the sides of the hills, with mouths closed by boulders in a manner scarcely accidental, and with more than an average quota of the queer prints leading both toward and away from them. If indeed the direction of these prints could be justly estimated, and worst of all, there were the things which adventurous people had seen very rarely in the twilight of the remotest valleys in the dense perpendicular woods above the limits of normal hill climbing. It would have been less uncomfortable if the stray accounts of these things had not agreed so well. As it was, nearly all the rumors had several points in common averring that the creatures were a sort of huge light red crab with many pairs of legs and with two great bat-like wings in the middle of the back. They sometimes walked on all their legs and sometimes on the hindmost pair only, using the others to convey large objects of indeterminate nature. On one occasion they were spied in considerable numbers, a detachment of them waiting along a shallow wooden Woodland watercourse, three abreast in evidently disciplined formation. Once a specimen was seen flying, launching itself from the top of a bald, lonely hill at night and vanishing in the sky after its great grappling wings had been silhouetted 
an instant against the full moon. These things seem content, on the whole, to let mankind alone. Though they were at times held responsible for the disappearance of venturesome individuals, especially persons who built houses too close to certain valleys or too high up on certain mountains. Many localities came to be known as in uh, Advisable to settle in, the feeling persisting long after the cause was forgotten. Field the wood woke up at some of the neighboring mountain precipices with a shudder, even when not recalling too many settlers had been lost, and how many farmhouses burnt to ashes on the lower slopes of those grim green sentinels. But while, according to the earliest legends, those creatures would appear to have harmed only those trespassing on their privacy, there were later accounts of their curiosity respecting men, and of their attempts to establish secret outposts in the human world. There were tales of the queer claw prints seen around farmhouse windows in the morning, and of occasional disappearances in regions outside the obviously haunted areas. Tales, besides of buzzing voices and imitation of human speech, which made surprising offers to lone travelers on roads and cart paths in the deep woods, and of children frightened out of their wits by things seen or heard, where the primal forest pressed close upon their dooryards. In the final layer of legends, the layer just preceding the decline of superstition and the abandonment of close contact with the dreaded places. There are shocked references to hermits and remote farmers who at some period of life appeared to have undergone a repellent mental change, and who were shunned and whispered about as mortals who had sold themselves to the strange beings. In one of the northeastern counties that seemed to be a fashion about 1800 to accuse eccentric and unpopular recluses of being allies or representatives of the abhorrent things. As to what the things were, explanations naturally varied. The common name applied to them was those ones, or the old ones, though other terms had a local and transient use. Perhaps the bulk of the Puritan settlers set them down bluntly as familiars of the devil, and made them a basis of all theological speculation, those with Celtic legendary in their heritage, mainly the Scottish-Irish element of New Hampshire and their kindred who had settled in Vermont on Governor Wentworth's colonial grants linked them vaguely with the malign fairies and little people of the bogs and rats, and protected themselves with the scraps of incantation handed down through many generations. But the Indians had the most fantastic theories of all. While different tribal legends deferred, there was a marked consensus of belief in certain vital particulars it being unanimously agreed that the creatures were not native to this earth. The Pentecook myths, which were the most consistent and picturesque, taught that the winged ones came from the great bear in the sky and had mines in our earthly hills whence they took a kind of stone they could not get on any other world. They did not live here, said the myths, but merely maintained outposts and flew back with vast cargoes of stone to their own stars in the north. They harmed only those earth people who got too near them were spied upon them. Animals shunned them through instinctive hatred, not because of being hunted. They could not eat the things and animals of earth, but brought their own food from the stars. It was bad to get near them, and sometimes young hunters who went into their hills never came back. It was not good either to listen to what they whispered at night in the forest with voices like a beast that tried to be like the voices of men. They knew the speech of all kinds of men, and the cooks who lines, men of five nations, but did not seem to have or need any speech of their own. They talked with their heads, which changed color in different ways to mean different things. All the legendary, of course, white and Indian alike, died down during the 19th century, except for occasional atavistical flare-ups. The ways of the Vermonters became settled, and once their habitual paths and dwellings were established according to a certain fixed plan, they remembered less and less what fears and avoidances had determined that plan, and even that there had been any fears or avoidances. Most people simply knew that certain hilly regions were considered as highly unhealthy, unprofitable, and generally unlucky to live in, and that the farther one kept from them, the better off one usually was. In time, the 
ruts of custom and economic interest became so deeply cut in approved places that there was no longer any reason for going outside them, and the haunted hills were left deserted by accident rather than by design, save during infrequent local scares, only wonder-loving grandmothers and retrospective non-vegetarians ever whispered of the dwellings in those hills, and even such whisperers admitted that there was not much to fear from those things now that they were used to the presence of houses and settlements, and now that human beings left their chosen territories Perfectly alone. All this I had known from my reading, and forth from certain folk tales picked up in New Hampshire. Hence, when the flood time rumors began to appear, I could easily guess what imaginative background had evolved them. I took great pains to explain this to my friends, and was correspondingly amused when several contention souls continue to insist on a possible element of truth in the reports. Such persons tried to point out that the early legends had a significant persistence and un... well, uniformity, and that the virtually unexplored nature of the Vermont Hills made it unwise to be dogmatic about what might or might not dwell among them. Nor could they be silenced by my assurance that all the myths were of a well-known pattern common to most of mankind and determined by early phases of imaginative experience, which always produced the same type of delusion. It was of no use to demonstrate to such opponents that the Vermont myths differed but little in essence from those universal legends of natural personification which filled the ancient world with fawns and dryads and satyrs suggested the Calacanzari of modern Greece and gave the wild whales in Ireland their dark hints of strange small and terrible hidden races of troglodytes and birds. No use either to point out the even more starting ladies summer belief of the Nepalese hill tribes and the dreaded Miko or abominable snowmen who were hideously amidst the ice and rock pinnacles of the Himalayan summits. When I brought up this evidence, my opponents turned it against me by claiming that it must imply some actual historicity for the ancient tales, that it must argue the real existence of some queer elder earth race driven to hiding after the advent and dominance of mankind, which might very conceivably have survived in reduced numbers to relatively recent times or even to the present. The more I laughed at such theories, the more these stubborn friends asservated them, adding that even without the heritage of legend, the recent reports were too clear, consistent, detailed, insanely prosaic in manner of telling to be completely ignored. Two or three fanatical extremists went so far as to hint at possible meanings in the ancient Indian tales which gave the hidden beings a non-terrestrial origin. Studying the extravagant books of Charles Fort with their claims that voyagers from other worlds in outer space have often visited Earth, most of my foes, however, were merely romanticists who insisted on trying to transfer to real life the fantastic or of working little people made popular by the magnificent horrification of Arthur Machen. Chapter 2, in just a moment here. i take some more coffee. Chapter 2, The Whisper in Darkness As was natural under those circumstances, this quaint unbeating finally got into print in the form of letters to the Arkham Advertiser, some of which were copied in the press of those Vermont regions. Whence the flood stories came, the Rutland Herald gave half a page of extracts from the letters on both sides, while the Brattleboro Reformer reprinted one of my long historical and mythological summaries in full, with some accompanying comments in the Pendrifter's thoughtful column, which supported and applauded my skeptical conclusions. By the spring of 1928, I was almost a well-known figure in Vermont, notwithstanding the fact that I had never set foot in the state. Then came the challenging letters from Henry Akalai, which 
impressed me so profoundly, Akili, and which took me for the first and last time to that fascinating realm of crowded green precipices and muttering forest streams, most of which I know now of Henry Wentworth Akali was gathered by correspondence with his neighbors and with his only son in California after my experience in his lonely farmhouse. He was, I discovered, the last representative on his home soil of a long, locally distinguished line of Joris. Administrators and gentlemen agriculturists. In him, however, the family mentally had veered away from practical affairs to pure scholarship, so that he had been a notable student of mathematics, astronomy, biology, anthropology, and folklore at the University of Vermont. I had never previously heard of him, and he did not give many autobiographical details in his communications, but from the first time I saw he was a man of character, education, and intelligence, albeit a recluse with very little worldly sophistication. Despite the incredible nature of what he claimed, I could not help at one taking the feeling more seriously than I had taken any of the other challengers of my views. For one thing, he was really close to the actual phenomena, visible and tangible, that he speculated so grotesquely about, and for another thing, he was amazingly willing to leave his conclusions in a tentative state like a true man of science. He had no personal references or preferences to advance, and was always guided by what he took to be solid evidence. Of course, I began by considering him mistaken, but gave him credit for being intelligently mistaken. At no time did I emulate some of his friends in attributing his ideas and his fear of the lonely green hills to to insanity. I could see that there was a great deal to the man, and I knew that what he reported must surely come from strange circumstances deserving investigation, however little it might have to do with the fantastic causes he assigned. Later on, I received from him certain material proofs which placed the matter on a somewhat different and bewilderingly bizarre basis. I cannot do better than transcribe in full, so far as, if possible, the long letter in which Chiquili introduced himself and which formed such an important landmark in my own intellectual history. It is no longer in my possession, but my memory holds almost every word of its portentous message. And again, I affirm my coincidence in the sanity of the family pruned handle on the end of the ceiling of the man who wrote it. Here is the text, a text which reached me in the cramped, archaic-looking scrawl of one who had obviously not mingled much with the world during his sedate, scholarly life. RFD number two, Townshend, Wyndham Company, Vermont, May the fifth, nineteen twenty-eight. Albert N. Wilmark Esquire, 118 Saltonstall Street, Arkham, Massachusetts. My dear sir, I have read with great interest the Brattleboro Reformers reprint, April the 23rd of 1928, of your letter on the recent stories of strange bodies seen floating in our flooded streams last fall and on the curious folklore they so well agree with. It is easy to see why an outlander would take the position you take and even why Pendrifter agrees with you. This is the attitude generally taken by educated persons both in and out of Vermont, and was my own attitude as a young man. I am now 57. Before my studies, both general and in Davenport's book, led me to do some exploring in parts of the hills hereabouts not usually visited. I was directed towards such studies by the queer old tales I used to hear from elderly farmers of the more ignorant sort, but now I wish I had let the whole matter alone. I might say with all proper modesty that the subject of anthropology and folklore is by no means strange to me. I took a good deal of it at college, and am familiar with most of the standard authorities such as Tyler, Lubbock, Fraser, Porter Phages, Maury, Osborne, Keith, O. G. Elliot Smith, and so on. It is no news to me that tales of hidden races are as old as all mankind. I have seen the reprints of letters from you and those arguing with you in the Rutland Herald, and guess I know about where your controversy stands in at the present time. What I desire to say now is that I am afraid your adversaries are nearer right than yourself, even though all reason seems to be on your side. They are nearer right than they realize themselves, for of course they go only by theory, and cannot know what I know. If I knew as little of the matter as they say, I would not feel justified in believing as they do. I will be wholly on your side. You can see that I am having a hard time getting to the point, probably because I really 
dread getting to the point, but the upshot of the matter is that I have certain evidence that monstrous things do indeed live in the woods on the high hills which nobody visits. I have not seen any of the things floating in the rivers as reported, but I have seen things like them under circumstances I dread to repeat. I have seen footprints any of the late. I have seen them near my own home. I live in the old artery place out of Townshead Village on the side of Dark Mountain. Then I dare tell you now, and I have overheard voices in at the woods at certain points that I will not even begin to describe on paper. At one place I heard them so much that I took a phonograph here and there, excuse me, with a dictaphone attachment and wax blank, and I shall to arrange to have you hear the record I got. I had run it on the machine for some of the old people up here, and one of the voices had nearly scared them, paralyzed by reason of its likeness to a certain voice, that buzzing voice in the woods which Davenport mentions that their grandmothers have told about and mimicked for them. I know what most people think of a man who tells about hearing voices, but before you draw conclusions, just listen to this record and ask some of the older backwoods people what they think of it. If you can account for it normally, very well, but there must be something behind it. Ex nihil, nihil of it, you know? Now, my object in writing to you is not sent as a start of an argument, but to give you information which I think a man of your taste will find deeply interesting. This is private. Publicly, I am on your side. For certain things, shoot me that it does not do for people to know too much about these matters. My own studies are now wholly private, and I would not think of saying anything to attract people's attention and cause them to visit the places I have explored. It is true, terribly true, that there are non-human creatures watching us all the time. With spies among us gathering information, it is from a rest man. If he was sane as I think he was, was one of those spies that I got a large part of my clues to the matter. He later killed himself. I have a reason to think there are others now. The things come from other another planet being able to live in an interstellar space and fly through it on clumsy, powerful wings which have a way of resisting the ether, but which are too poor at steering to be of much use in helping them about on Earth. I will tell you about this later if you do not dismiss me yet once as a madman. They come here to get metals from mines that go deep in under the hills, and I think I know where they come from. They will not hurt us if we let them alone, but no one can say what will happen if we get too curious about them. Of course, a good army of men could wipe out their mining colony, that is what they are afraid of, but if that happened, more will come from outside. Any number of them, they could easily conquer the earth, but have not tried so far because they have not needed to. They would rather leave things as they are to save father. I think they mean to get rid of me because of what I have discovered. There is a great wax stone with none known hieroglyphics have worn away, which I found in the woods on Round Hill, east of here, and after I took it home, everything became different. If they think I suspect too much, they will either kill me or take me off of the earth to where they come from. They like to take away men of learning once in a while to keep informed on the state of things in the human world. This leads me to my secondary purpose in addressing you, namely to urge you to hush up the present debate rather than give it more publicly. Publicity. People must be kept away from these hills, and in order to effect this, their curiosity ought not to be aroused any further. Heaven knows there is peril enough anyway, with promoters and real estate men flooding Vermont, with herds of summer people to overrun the wild places and cover the hills with cheap bungalows. I shall welcome further communication with you, and shall try to send you that phonograph record in Blackstone, which is so worn that photographs don't shoot much, but I express if you are willing, I say try, because I think those creatures have a way of tampering with things around here. There is a sullen photo fellow named Brown on a farm near the village, who I think is their spy. Little by little, they are trying to cut me off from our world, because I know too much about their world. They have the most amazing way of finding out what I do. You may not even get this letter. I think I shall have to leave this part of the country and go live with my son in San Diego, California. If things get any worse, but it is not easy to give the place you were born in and where your family has lived for six generations. Also, I would hardly dare sell this house to anybody now that the creatures have taken notice of it. They seem to be trying to get the black stone back and destroy the phonograph record, but I shall not let them if I can help it. My great police dogs always hold them back, for there are very few here as yet, and they are clumsy in getting about 
as I have said, their wings are not much use for short flights on earth. I am on the very brink of deciphering that stone in a very terrible way, and with your knowledge of folklore, you may be able to supply missing links enough to help me. I suppose you know all about the fearful missing to dating the coming of man to the earth, the Yogsathath and Kutovu cycles, which are hinted to in the Necronomicon, I had access to a copy of that once and here that you have worn in your college library under lock and key. To conclude, Mr. Wilmarth, I think that with our respective studies, we can be very useful to each other. I don't wish to put you in any peril, and suppose I ought to warn you that possession of the stone in the record won't be very safe, but I think you will find any risk worth running for the sake of knowledge. I will drive down to Newfane or Battleborough to send whatever you authorize me to send, for the express offices there are more to be trusted. I might say that I live quite alone now, since I can't keep hired help anymore. They won't stay because of the things that try to get near the house at night, and that keep the dogs barking continually. I am glad I didn't get as deep as this into the business while my wife was alive, for it would have driven her mad, hoping that I'm not bothering you unduly, and that you will decide to get in touch with me rather than throw this letter into the wastebasket as a madman's rave, and I am. Yours very truly, Henry. W. Akele. P.S. I am making some extra prints of certain photographs taken by me, which I will think will help to prove a number of the points I have touched on. The world people will think they are monstrous and true. I shall send you these very soon if you're interested. H.W.A. It would be difficult to describe my sentiments upon reading this strange document for the first time. By all ordinary rules, I ought to have lost and laughed more loudly at these extravagances than at the far milder theories which had previously moved me to mirth, yet something in the tone of the letter made me take it with paradoxical seriousness. Not that I believed for a moment in the hidden race from the stars which my correspondent spoke of, but that after some grave preliminary doubts I grew to feel oddly sure of his sanity and sincerity, and of his confrontation by some genuine though singular and abnormal phenomenon which he could not explain plain, except in this imaginative way. It could not be as he thought it. I reflected. Yet on the other hand, it could not be otherwise than worthy of investigation. The man seemed unduly excited and alarmed about something, but it was hard to think that all cause was lacking. He was so specific and logical in certain ways, and after all, his yarn did fit in so perplexingly well with some of the old myths, even the wildest Indian legends, that he had really overheard disturbing voices in the hills, and had really found the black stone he spoke about, the holy, though was wholly possible despite his crazy inferences he had made, inferences probably suggested by the man who had claimed to be a spy of the outer beings and had later killed himself. It was easy to deduce this, that this man must have been wholly insane, but that he probably had a streak of perverse outward logic which made the naive Keely, already prepared for such things by his folklore studies, believe to be, believe his tale. As for the latest developments, it appeared from his inability to keep hired help that Achilles' humbler, rustic neighbors were as convinced as he that his house was besieged by uncanny things at night. The dogs really barked too, and in the matter of the that phonograph record, which I could not but believe he had obtained in the way he said. It must mean something, whether animal noise is deceptively like human speech, or the speech of some hidden, night-haunting human being decayed to a state not much above that of lower animals. From this my thoughts went back to the black hieroglyph stone, and to speculations upon what it might mean. Then, too, what of the phonographs which Achilles said he was about to send, and which the old people had found so convincingly terrible, as I re-read the cramped and writing, I felt as never before that my credulous opponents might have more on their side than I had conceded. After all, there might be some queer and perhaps hereditarily misshapen outcasts in those shunned hills, even though no such race of star-born monsters as folklore claimed. And if there were, then the presence of strange bodies in the flooded streams would not be wholly beyond belief. Was it too presumptuous to suppose that both the old legends and the recent reports had this much of reality behind them? But even as I harbored these doubts, I felt ashamed that so fantastic a piece of bizarre, bizarre as Henry Achilles' wild letter had brought them up. In the end, I answered Achilles' letter, adapting a tone of friendly interest and soliciting 
further particulars. His reply came almost by return mail and contained, true, it premised a number of Kodak views of scenes and objects illustrating what he had to tell. Glancing at these pictures as I took them from the envelope, I felt a curious sense of fright and nearness to forbidden things, for in spite of the vagueness of most of them, they had a damnably suggestive power which was intensified by the fact of their being genuine photographs. Actual optical links with what they portrayed in the product of an impersonal transmitting process without prejudice, fallibility, or mendacity. The more I looked at them, the more I saw that my serious estimate of Healy and his story had not been unjustified. Certainly, these pictures carry conclusive evidence of something in the Vermont Hills, which was at least basically outside the radius of our common knowledge and belief. The worst thing of all was the footprint. A view taken where the sun shone on a mud patch somewhere in a deserted upland. This was no cheaply counterfeited thing I could see at a glance, for the sharply defined pebbles and grass blades in the field of vision gave a clear index of scale and left no possibility of a tricky double exposure. I have called the thing a footprint, but claw print would be a better term. Even now, I can scarcely describe it, save to say that it was hideously crab-like and that there seemed to be some ambiguity about its direction. It was not a very deep or fresh print, but seemed to be about the size of an average man's foot from a central pad pairs of saw tooth nippers projected in opposite directions quite baffling as the function, if indeed the whole object were exclusively an organ of locomotion. Another photograph, evidently a time exposure taken in deep shadow, was of the mouth of a woodland cave with a boulder of rounded regularity choking the aperture. On the bare ground in front of it was just a certain intense network of curious tracks, and when I studied the picture with a magnifier, I felt uneasily sure that the tracks were like the one in the other view. A third picture shoot a druid-like circle of standing stones on the summit of a wild hill. Around the cryptic circle, the grass was very much bleaten down and worn away though I could not detect any footprints even with the glass. The extreme remoteness of the place was apparent from the veritable sea of tenantless mountains which formed the background and stretched away toward a misty horizon. But if the most disturbing of all the views was that of the footprint, the most curiously suggested was that of the great black stone found in the round hill woods. Akili had photographed it on what was evidently his study table, for I could see rows of books and a bust of Milton in the background. The thing, as nearly as one might guess, had faced the camera vertically with a somewhat irregularly curved surface of one by two feet. But to say anything definite about that surface or about the general shape of the whole mass almost defies the power of language. What outlandish geometrical principles that guided its cutting, for artificially cut it surely was, I could not even begin to guess, and never before had I seen anything which struck me as so strangely and unmistakably alien to this world. Of the hieroglyphics on the surface, I could discern very few, but one or two that I did see gave me rather a shock. Of course, they might be fraudulent, for others beside myself had read the monstrous and abhorred Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Azarid, but it nevertheless made me shiver to recognize certain ideographs which study had taught me to link with the most blood-curdling and blasphemous whispers of things that had had a kind of mad half-existence before the earth and the other inner worlds of the solar system were made. One of the five remaining pictures, there were a swamp and hill scenes which seemed to bear traces of hidden and unwholesome tendency. Another was a queer mark in the ground very near Achilles' house, which he said he had photographed the morning after a night on which the dogs had barked more violently than usual. It was very blurred, and one could really draw no certain conclusions from it, but it did seem fiendishly like that other mark or claw print photographed on the deserted upland. The final picture was of the Achille place itself, a trim white house of two stories and attic about a century and a quarter old, and with a well-kept lawn and stone border path leading up to a tastefully carved me, Georgian doorway. There were several huge police dogs on the lawn, squatting near a pleasant, pleasant-faced man with a close-cropped gray beard whom I took to be Achille himself. His own photographer, one might infer, from the two connected balls in his right hand. From the pictures, I turned to the bulky, closely written letters itself for the next three hours, was immersed in a gulf of unutterable horror. Where Achille had given only outlines before, he now entered into minute details, presenting long transcripts of words, eh, words overheard in the woods that night, long accounts of 
monstrous pinkish form providing thickets at twilight on the hills and a terrible cosmic narrative derived from the application of profound and varied scholarship to the endless cycle and discourses of the mad self-styled spy who had killed himself. I found myself faced by names and terms that I had heard elsewhere in the most hideous of connections. Dikak, Great Kuthabu, Satak, Yog Satath, Ryan, as I thought, Pastor, Yayan, Lang, the Wake of Halai, Beth Mora, the Yellow Sign, Elamur Kutus, Bran, and the Magnum Inamandum was drawn back through nameless eons and inconceivable dimensions to worlds of elder, outer entity at which the crazed author of the Necronomicon had only guessed in the vaguest way. I was told of the pits of primal life and of the streams that had trickled down there from and finally, of the tiny rivulet from one of those dreams which had become entangled with the destinies of our own earth, my brain world, and where before I had attempted to explain things away, I now began to believe in the most abnormal and incredible wonders. The array of vital evidence was damnably vast and overwhelming in the cool, scientific attitude of Achille, an attitude removed as far as imaginable from the demented, the fanatical, the satirical, or even the extravagantly speculative, had a tremendous effect on my thought and judgment. By the time I laid the frightful letter aside, I could understand the fears he had come to entertain, and was ready to do anything in my power to keep people away from those wild haunted hills. Even now, when time has dulled the impression and made me have questioned my own experience and horrible doubts, there are things in that letter of Achilles which I would not quote or even form into words on paper. I am almost glad that the letter and record and photographs are gone now, and I wish for reasons I shall soon make clear that the new planet beyond Neptune had not been discovered. With the reading of that letter, my public debating about the Vermont horror permanently ended. Arguments from opponents remained unanswered or put off with promises, and eventually the controversy peered. Petered out until oblivion during late May and June. I was in constant correspondence with the Keeley, but once in a while a letter would be lost, so that we would have to retrace our ground and perform considerable laborious copying. What were we trying to do as a whole was to compare notes and matters of obscure mythological scholarship and arrive at a clearer correlation of the Vermont horrors with the general body of Vermonted world legend. For one thing, we virtually decided that these morbidities in the hellish Himalayan Migo were one and the same order of incarnated nightmare. There were also absorbing zoological conjectures, which I would have referred to Professor Dexter in my own college before Achilles' imperative command to tell no one of the matter before us. If I seem to display the command now, it is only because I think that at this stage of warning about, I'm going to repeat this, if I seem to disobey that command now, it is only because I think that at this stage a warning about those farther Vermont hills and about those Himalayan peaks, which bold explorers are more and more determined to ascend, is more conducive to public safety than silence would be. One specific thing we were leading up to was a deciphering of the hieroglyphics on that infamous black stone, a deciphering which might well place us in possession of secrets deeper and more dizzying than any formerly known to man. The Whisper in Darkness. We're almost to chapter three here. Chapter 3. Toward the end of June, the phonograph record came, shipped from Brattleboro. Alright. Since Achilles was unwilling to address conditions on the branch line north of there, he had begun to feel an increased sense of espionage, aggravated by the loss of some of our letters, and said much about the insidious deeds of certain men whom he considered tools and agents of the hidden 
the hidden beans. Most of all, he suspected the surly farmer, Walter Brown, who lived alone on a run-down hillside place near the deep woods, and who was often seen loafing around corners in Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, New Fane in South, London Dairy, in the most inexplicable and seemingly unmotivated way. Brown's voice, he felt convinced, was one of those he had overheard on a certain occasion in a very terrible conversation, and he had once found a footprint or claw print near Brown's house which might possess the most ominous significance. It had been curiously near some of Brown's own footprints, footprints that faced toward it. So the record was shipped from Brattleboro Wither. Achille drove in his four car along the lonely Vermont back roads. He confessed in an accompanying note that he was beginning to be afraid of those roads and that he would not even go into town send for supplies now except in broad daylight. It did not pay. He repeated again and again to know too much unless one were very remote from those silent and problematical hills. He would be going to California pretty soon to live with his son, though it was hard to leave a place where all one's memories and sins and ancestral feeling centered before trying the record on the commercial machine, which I borrowed from the college administration. Sin building, I carefully went over all the explanatory matter in Achilles' various letters. This record, he had said, was obtained about 1 a.m. on the 1st of May, 1915, near the closed mouth of a cave where the wooded west slope of Dark Mountain rises out of Lee's Swamp. The place had always been unusually plagued with strange voices, this being the reason he had brought the phonograph, dictaphone, and blank in expectation of results. Former experience had told him that in May Eve, the hideous Sabbat night of underground European legend would probably be more fruitful than any other date, and he was not disappointed. It was noteworthy, though, that he never again heard voices at that particular spot. Unlike most of the overheard forest voices, the substance of the record was quasi-ritualistic and included one probably human voice which Achille had never been able to place. It was not Brown's, but seemed to be that of a man of greater cultivation. The second voice, however, was the real crux of the thing, for this was the accursed buzzing, which had no likeness to humanity, despite the human words which it uttered in good English grammar and a scholarly accent. The recording phonograph and dictaphone had not worked uniformly well, and had of course been at a great disadvantage because of the remote and muffled nature of the overheard ritual. So that the actual speech secured was very fragmentary. Akili had given me a transcript of what he believed the spoken words to be, and I glanced through this again as I prepared the machine for action. This text was darkly mysterious rather than openly horrible, though a knowledge of its origin and matter of gathering gave it all the associative horror which any words could well possess. I will present it here in full as I remember it, and I am fairly confident that I know it correctly. By heart, not only from reading the transcript, but from playing the record itself over and over again. It is not a thing which one might readily forget. Indistinguishable sounds, a cultivated male human voice, is the lord of the woods, even too, and the gifts of the men of Lang. So from the wells of night to the gulfs of space, and from the gulfs of space to the wells of night, ever the presence of great Cthulhu, of Sataka, and of him who is not to be named, ever their praises, and of Abundance to the black goat of the woods. Ah, Shab, no go wrath. The goat with a thousand young, a buzzing imitation of human speech. Ah, Shab, no go wrath. The black goat of the woods with a thousand young, human voice. And it has come to pass that the Lord of the Woods, being seven and nine, down the onyx steps, try used to him in the gulf, as it thought he of whom thou hast thought. Us marvels on the wings of night, out beyond space, out beyond to that whereof Yogurt is the youngest child, rolling alone in black aether at the rim, buzzing voice. Go out among men and find the ways thereof, that he in the gulf may know, to Naraleth the te, mighty messenger must all things be told, and he shall put on the semblance of men, the waxen mask and the rope that hides, and come down from the world of seven sons to mock. Human voice, Nairolathotep, great messenger, bringer of strange joy to young Gatha through the void, father of the million favored ones, stalker among, speech cut off by end of record. Such were the words for which I was to listen when I started the phonograph. It was with a trace of genuine dread and reluctance that I pressed the lever and heard the preliminary scratch into the sapphire point, and I was glad that the first faint, fragmentary words were in human voice. 
a mellow, educated voice which seemed vaguely Bostonian in accent, and which was certainly not that of any native of the Vermont hills. As I listened to the tantalizingly feeble rendering, I seemed to find the speech identical with Keeley's carefully prepared transcript, on it chanted in that mellow Bostonian voice, Ah, Shub Nagarath, the goat with a thousand young, and then I heard the other voice. To this hour I shudder retrospectively when I think of how it struck me, prepared through though I was by Achilles accounts. Those of whom I have since described the record profess to find nothing but sheep, imposture, or madness in it. But could they have heard the cursed thing itself or read the bulk of Achilles' correspondence, especially that terrible and encyclopedic second letter? I know they would think differently. It is, after all, a tremendous pity that I did not disobey Achilles and play the record for others. A tremendous pity, too, that all of his letters were lost to me with my first-hand impression of the actual sounds, and with my knowledge of the background and surrounding circumstances, the voice was a monstrous thing. It swiftly followed the human voice in ritualistic response, but in my imagination it was a morbid echo winging its way across unimaginable abysses from unimaginable outer hells. It is more than two years now since I last ran off that blasphemous waxen cylinder, but at this moment, and all other moments, I can still hear that feeble, fiendish buzzing as it reached me for the first time. Yeah. Shub Niggurath, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, but thought that voice is always in my ears. I have not even yet been able to analyze it well enough for a graphic description. It was like the drone of some loathsome gigantic insect ponderously shaped into the articulate speech of an alien species, and I am perfectly certain that the organs producing it can have no resemblance to the vocal organs of man, or indeed to those of any of the mammalia. There were singularities in timber, range, and overtones which placed this phenomenon wholly outside the sphere of humanity and earth life. Its sudden advent that first time almost stunned me, and I heard the rest of the record through in a sort of abstracted daze. When the longer passage of buzzing came, there was a sharp intensification of that feeling of blasphemous infinity which had struck me during the shorter and earlier passage. At last, the record ended abruptly during an unusually clear speech of the human and Bostonian voice, and I sat stupidly staring long after the machine had automatically stopped. I hardly need say that I gave that shocking record many another plane, and that I made exhaustive attempts at analysis and comment and comparing notes with Akili. It would be both useless and disturbing to repeat here all that we concluded but I may hint that we agreed in believing we had secured a clue to the source of some of the most repulsive primordial customs in the cryptic elder religions of mankind. It seemed plain to us also that there were ancient and elaborate alliances between the hidden utter creatures and certain members of the human race. How extensive these alliances were, and how their state today might compare with their state in earlier ages, we had no means of guessing, yet at best there was room for a limitless amount of horrified speculation. These seem to be an awful and memorial linkage in several definite stages betwixt man and nameless infinity. The blasphemies which appeared on earth, it was hinted, came from the dark planet Yugoth at the rim of the solar system, but this was itself merely the populous outpost of our frightful interstellar race whose ultimate source must lie far outside even the Einsteinian space-time continuum or greater known cosmos. Meanwhile, we continue to discuss the Blackstone and the best way of getting it to Arkham. Our Achille, deeming it inadvisable to have me visit him at the scene of his nightmare studies. For some reason or other, Achille was afraid to trust the thing to any ordinary or respected transportation route. His final idea was to take it across the country to Bellows Falls and ship it on the Boston and Maine system through Keene and Lynch to Don and Fishburg, even though this would necessitate his driving along somewhat lonelier and more forest traversing hill roads than the main highway to Brattleboro. He said he had noticed a man around the express office at Brattleboro when he had sent the phonograph record, whose actions and expression had been far from reassuring. This man had seemed too anxious to talk with the clerks, and he had taken the train on which the record was shipped. Achille confessed that he had not felt strictly at ease about the record until he heard from me of its safe receipt. About this time, the second week in July, another letter of mine went astray, as I learned through an anxious communication from Achille. After that, he told me to address him no more at Townsend, but to send all mail in care of the general delivery at Brattleboro, whether he would make frequent trips either in his car or on the motor coach line, which had lately replaced passenger service on the lagging branch railway. I could see that he was getting more and more anxious 
for he went into much detail about the increased barking of the dogs on moonless nights and about the fresh claw prints that he sometimes found in the road and in the mud at the back of his farmyard when morning came. Once he told about a veritable army of prints drawn up in a line facing an equally thick and resolute line of dog tracks and sat in a loathsomely disturbing Kodak feature to prove it, that was, after a night on which the dogs had outdone themselves in barking and howling, on the morning of Wednesday, July the 18th, I received a telegram from Bellows Falls in which Achille said he was expressing the black stone over the B&M on train number 5508, leaving Bellows Falls at 12.15 p.m. standard time and two at the North Station in Boston at 4.12 p.m. I ought I calculated to get up to Arkham at least by the next noon, and accordingly I stayed all Thursday morning to receive in it. But noon came and went without its advent, and when I telephoned down to the press office, I was informed that no shipment for me had arrived. Next act, for firm amidst a growling alarm, was to give a long-distance call to the express agent at the Boston North Station, and I was scarcely surprised to learn that my consignment had not appeared. Train number 5508 had pulled in only 35 minutes late on the day before, but it contained no box addressed to me. The agent promised, however, no institute but to institute a search and inquiry, and I ended the day by sending a key to a night letter outlining the situation. With commendable promptness, the report came from the Boston office on the following afternoon. The agent telephoning as soon as he learned the facts. It seemed that the railway express clerk on number 5508 had been able to recall an incident which might have been Bearing on oh my loss, an argument with a very curious voiced man, lean, sandy, and rustic looking, when the train was waiting at Keene and H shortly after one o'clock standard time. The man, he said, was greatly excited about a heavy box, which he claimed to expect, but which was neither on the train nor entered on the company's books. He had given the name of Stanley Adams, and had had such a queerly thick droning voice that it made the clerk abnormally dizzy and sleepy to listen to him. The clerk could not remember quite how the conversation had ended, but recalled starting into a poor awakeness when the train began to move. The Boston agent added that this clerk was a young man of wholly unquestioned veracity and reliability of unknown. Answered that incidents, and along with the company. That evening I went to Boston to interview the clerk in person. I haven't obtained his name and address from the office. It was a frank, proposed, possessing fellow that I saw that he could not add nothing to his original account. Oddly, he was scarcely sure that he could even recognize the strange inquirer again, realizing that he had no more to tell. I returned to Arkham and sat up till morning, writing letters to Achille, to the express company, and to the police department, and the station agent in King. I felt that the strange voice man who had so queerly affected the clerk must have a pivotal place in the ominous business, and hoped that Keen station employees and telegraph office records might tell something about him and about he how he happened to make his inquiry when and where he did. I must admit, however, that all my investigations came to nothing. The clear voice man had indeed been noticed around the King Station in the early afternoon of July the 18th. <laughs> and one longer seemed to couple him vaguely with a heavy box, but he was altogether unknown and had not been seen before or since. He had not visited the telegraph office or received any message so far as he could be learned, nor had any message which might justly be considered a notice of the Blackstone's presence on number 5508 come through the office for anyone. Naturally, Achille joined with me in conducting these inquiries, and even made a personal trip to Keene to question the people around the station, but his attitude toward the matter was more fatalistic than mine. It was more fatalistic than mine. He seemed to find the loss of the box of portentous and menacing fulfillment of inevitable tendencies, and no real hope at all of its recovery. He spoke of the undoubted telepathic and hypnotic powers of the hill creatures and their agents, and in one letter, Hinted that he did not believe the stone was on this earth any longer. For my part, I was duly enraged, for I had felt there was at least a chance of learning profound and astonishing things from the old blurred hieroglyphs. The matter would have ranked bitterly in my mind had not Achilles' immediate subsequent letters brought up a new phase of the whole horrible hill problem which had once seized all my attention. In chapter 4, in just a moment. H.P. Lovecraft, The Whisper in Darkness. The unknown things Achille wrote in a script grown pitifully tremulous had begun to close in on him with a wholly new degree of determination. The nocturnal barking of the dogs whenever the moon was dim or absent was hideous now. 
and there had been attempts to molest him on the lonely roads he had traversed by day. On the 2nd of August, while bound for the village in his car, he had found a tree trunk laid in his path at a point where the highway ran through a deep batch of woods, while the savage barking of the two great dogs he had with him told all too well of the things which must have been lurking near. What would have happened had the dogs not been there? He did not dare guess, but he never went out now without at least two of his faithful and powerful pack. Other road experiences occurred on August the 5th and 6th. The shot grazed in his car on one occasion, and the barking of the dogs telling of unholy woodland presences on the other. On August the 15th, I received a frantic letter which disturbed me greatly. It did disturb me very greatly, which made me wish Achilles could put aside his lonely reticence and call into all of the way. Excuse me, the aid of the law. There had been frightful happenings on the night of the 12th to the 13th. Bullets flying outside the farmhouse, and three of the twelve great dogs being found shot dead in the morning. There were myriads of claw prints on the road, with the human prints of Walter Brown among them. Achilles had started to telephone to Brattleboro for more dogs, but the wire had gone dead before he had a chance to say much. Later, he went to Brattleboro in his car and learned there that Lyman had found the main telephone cable, neatly cut at a point where it ran through the deserted hills north of Newfane. But he was about to start home with four fine new dogs and several cases of ammunition for his big game riveting rifle. The letter was written at the post office in Brattleboro and came through to me without delay. My attitude toward the matter was by this time quickly slipping from a scientific to an alarmedly personal one. I was afraid for Achilles in his remote, lonely farmhouse and half afraid for myself because of my now defiant connection with the strange hill problem. The thing was reaching out, so would it suck me in and engulf me? And replying to his letter, I urged him to seek help, and hid that I might take action myself if he did not. I spoke of visiting Vermont in person in spite of his wishes, and of helping him explain the situation to the proper authorities in return, however. I received only a telegram from Bellows Falls which read thus, I appreciate your position, but can do nothing. Take direction yourself, for it could only harm both. Wait for explanation. Henry Keeley. But the affair was steadily deepening. Upon my, my replying to the telegram, I received a shaking note from Achille with the astonishing news that he had not only never seen or sent the wire, but had not received the letter from which me, to which it was an obvious reply. Hasty inquiries by him at Bilbo's Falls had brought out that the message was the this was deposited by a strange sandy haired man with a curiously thick, droning voice. Though more than this he could not learn, the clerk shoot him the original text is scrawled in pencil by the sender, but the handwriting was wholly unfamiliar. It was noticeable that the signature was misspelled A-K-E-L-Y without the second E. Certain conjectures were inevitable, but the midst of the obvious crises, he did not stop to elaborate upon them. He spoke of the death of more dogs and the purchase of still others, one of the exchange of gunfire, which had become a subtle feature each moonless night. Brown's prints and the prints of at least one or two more shod human figures were now found regularly among the claw prints in the road and at the back of the farmyard. It was, Achilles admitted, a pretty bad business, and before long he would probably have to go to live with his California son whether or not he could sell the old place, but it was not easy to leave the only spot one could really think of as home. He must try to hang on a little longer. Perhaps he could scare off the intruders, especially if he only openly and gave up all further attempts to penetrate their secrets. Writing Keeley at once, I renewed my offers of aid, and spoke again of visiting him and helping him convince the authorities of his dire peril. In his reply, he seemed less set against that plan. Then his past attitude would have led one to predict, but said he would like to hold off a little while longer, long enough to get his things in order and reconcile himself to the idea of leaving an almost morbidly cherished birthplace. People looked askance to his studies and speculations, and it would be better to get quietly off without setting the countryside in a turmoil and creating widespread doubts of his own sanity. He had had enough, he admitted, but he wanted to make a dignified exit if he could. This letter reached out to me on the 28th of August, and I prepared and mailed as encouraging a reply as I could. Apparently, the encouragement had an effect, for Akili had fewer terrors to report when he acknowledged my note. It was... <laughs> he was not very optimistic, though, and expressed the belief that it was only the full moon season which was holding the creatures off. He hoped there would not be many densely cloudy nights and talked vaguely of boarding in Brattleboro when the moon waned. Again, I wrote him encouragingly, 
but on September the 5th there came a fresh communication which had obviously crossed in my letter in the mails, and to this I could not give any such hopeful response. In view of its importance, I believe I had better give it in full, as best I can do from memory of the shaky script. It ran substantially as follows. Monday. Dear Wilmarth, a rather discouraging P.S. to my last. Last night was thick and cloudy, though no rain, and not a bit of moonlight got through. Things were pretty bad, and I think the end is getting near, in spite of all we have hoped. After midnight, something landed on the roof of the house, and the dogs all rushed up to see what it was. I could hear them snapping and tearing around, and then one managed to get on the roof by jumping from the low L. There was a terrible fight up there, and I heard a frontal buzzing, which I'll never forget, and then there was a shocking smell. But at the same time, bulls came through the window, which nearly grazed me. I think the main line of the hill creatures that got close to the house when the dogs divided because of the roof business. What was up there, I don't know yet, but I'm afraid the creatures are learning to steer better with their space wings. I put out the light and used the windows for loopholes, and raked all around the house with rifle fire aimed just high enough to not hit the dogs that seemed to end the business, but in the morning I found great pools of blood in the yard beside pools of a green sticky stuff that it was the worst odor I have ever smelled. I climbed up on the roof and found more of the sticky stuff there. Five of the dogs were killed. I'm afraid I hit one myself by aiming too low for he was shot in the back. Now I am setting the pains the shots broke and going to Brattleboro for more dogs. I guess the men at the kennels think I'm crazy. We'll drop another note later. Suppose I'll be ready for moving in a week or two though it nearly kills me to think of it hastily. Akili. But this was not the letter from Akili to cross mine. On the next morning, in September 6th, still another came, this time a frantic scrawl which utterly unnerved me and put me at a loss what to say or do next. Again, I cannot do better than quote the text as faithfully as memory will let me. Tuesday, class didn't break, so no moon again and going into the wane anyhow. I'd have the house wired for electricity and put in a searchlight if I didn't know. They'd cut the cables as fast as they could be mended. I think I'm going crazy. It may be that all I ever written you is a dream or madness. It was wow, oh, yes it was bad enough before, but this time it is too much. They talked to me last night talked in that cursed buzzing voice and told me things that I dare not repeat to you. I heard them plainly over the barking of the dogs, and once they were drowned out, a human voice helped them. Keep out of this, Wilmarth. It is worse than either you or I ever suspected. They don't mean to let me get to California now. They want to take me off alive, or what theoretically and mentally amounts to alive, not only to Yugoth but beyond that, a way outside the galaxy and possibly beyond the last curved ruin of space, rim of space, excuse me. I told them I wouldn't go where they wish, or in the terrible way they promised to take me, proposed to take me, but I'm afraid it will be no use. My place is so far out, they may come by day as well as by night before long. Six more dogs killed, and I felt presence all along. The wooden parts of the road when I drove to Brattleboro today. It was a mistake for me to try to send you that phonograph record in Blackstone. Better smash the record before it's too late. We'll drop you another line tomorrow if I'm still here. Wish I could arrange to get my books and things to Brattleboro and board there. I would run off without anything if I could, but something inside my mind holds me back. I can slip out to Brattleboro where I ought to be safe, but I feel just as much a prisoner there as at the house, and I seem to know that I couldn't get much farther even if I dropped everything and tried. It is horrible. Don't get mixed up in this. Yours, Akili. I did not sleep at all the night after receiving this terrible thing, and was utterly baffled as to Keeley's remaining degree of sanity. The substance of the note was wholly insane, yet the manner of expression, in view of all that had gone before, had a grimly potent quality of convincingness. I made no attempt to answer it, thinking it better to wait until Keeley might have time to reply to my latest communication. Such a reply indeed came on the following day, though the fresh material in it quite overshadowed any of the points brought up by the letter it nominally answered. Here is what I recall of the text scrawled and blotted as it was in the course of a plainly frantic and hurried composition. Wednesday, W. Year later came, but it's no use to discuss anything anymore. I am fully resigned. Wonder that I have even enough willpower left to fight them off. Can escape, even if I are willing to give up everything and run. They'll get me. Had a letter from them yesterday. RFD man brought it while I was at Brattleboro, typed in postmark Bellows Falls. Tells what they want to do with me. I can't repeat it. Look out for yourself, too. Smash that record. 
Cloudy nights keep up and moon waning all the time. Wish I dared to get help. It might brace up my willpower, but everyone who would dare to come at all would call me crazy unless there happened to be some proof. Couldn't ask people to come for no reason at all. Am all out of touch with everybody and have been for years. But I haven't told you the worst, Will Marth. Brace up to read this. But it will give you a shock, I am telling you the truth though, it is this, I have seen and touched one of the things, or part of one of the things, God man, but it's awful, it was dead, of course, one of the dogs had it and I found it near the kennel this morning, I tried to save in the woodshed to convince people of the whole thing, but it all evaporated in a few hours, nothing left, you know, all those things in the rivers were seen only on the first morning after the flood, and here's the words, I tried to photograph it for you, but when I developed the film there wasn't anything visible except the woodshed. What can the thing have been made of? I saw it and felt it, and they all leave footprints. It was surely made of matter, but what kind of matter? The shape can't be described. It was a great crab with a lot of pyramided fleshy rings or knots of thick, ropey stuff covered with feelers where a man's head would be. That green sticky stuff is its blood or juice, and where are more of them do on earth any minute? Walter Brown is missing. Hasn't been seen loafing around any of his usual corners in the villages whereabouts, hereabouts. I must have got him with one of the, my shots. Though the creatures always seem to try to take their dead and wounded away. Got him to the town this afternoon without any trouble. But I'm afraid they're beginning to hold off because they destroy of me. I am writing this in Brattleboro, P.O. This may be goodbye if it is right, my son George. Good enough, Akeley. 176 Pleasant Street. San Diego, California, but don't come up here. Write a boy if you don't hear from me in a week and watch the papers for news. I'm going to play my last two cards now, if I have the willpower left. First, to try poison gas on the things. I've got the right chemicals and have fixed up masks for myself and the dogs. And then if that doesn't work, tell the sheriff. They can lock me in a madhouse if they want to. It'll be better than what the other creatures would do. Perhaps I can get them to pay attention to the prints around the house. They are faint, but I can find them every morning. Suppose, though, police would say I faked them somehow, for they all think I'm a queer character. Must try to have a state policeman spend a night here and see for himself, though it would be just like the creatures to learn about it and hold off that night. They cut my wires whenever I try to telephone in the night. The linemen think it is very queer and may testify for me if they don't go and imagine I cut them myself. I haven't tried to keep them repaired for over a week now, I could get some of the ignorant people to testify for me about the reality of the horrors. But everybody laughs at what they say, and anyway, they have shunned my place for so long that they don't know of any of the new events. You couldn't get one of those run-down farmers to come within a mile of miles for a glove or money. The mail carrier hears what they say and jokes me about it. God, if only he dared tell them how real it is. I think I'll try to get him to notice the prince, but he comes in the afternoon and usually about gone by that time. If I kept on by setting a boxer pan over it, he'd think surely it was a fake or a joke. Wish I hadn't gotten to be such a hermit, so folks don't drop around as they used to. I've never dared shoot the black stone or the Kodak pictures or play their record to anybody but the ignorant people. The others would say I fake the whole business and do nothing but laugh, but I may yet try shooting the pictures. They give this call Prince Cleary, even if the things they made, you know, them, can't be photographed. What a shame nobody else saw that this thing this morning before it went to nothing, but I don't know as I care. After what I've been through, a madhouse is as good as place as any. The doctors can help me make up my mind to get away from this house, and that is all that will save me. Write my son George if you don't hear soon. Goodbye. Smash that record and don't mix up in this. Yours, Akili. This letter frankly plunged me into the blackest of terror. I did not know what to say in answer, but scratched off some incoherent words of advice and encouragement and sent them by registered mail. I recall urging Akili to move to Brattleboro at once and place himself under the protection of the authorities, adding that I will come to that town with a photograph record and help convince the courts of its sanity. It was time, too, I think I wrote, to alarm the people generally against this thing in their midst. It will be observed that at this moment of stress, my own belief in it all... Akili had told and claimed was virtually complete, though I did think his failure to get a picture of the dead monster was due not to any freak of nature, but to some excited slip of his own. On to chapter 5, in just a moment. Five. 
H.P. Lovecraft, The Whisperer in Darkness. Then, apparently, crossing my incoherent note and reaching me Saturday afternoon, September 8th, came that curiously different to call me letter nearly typed on a new machine, that strange letter of reassurance and invitation, which must have marked so prodigious a transition in the whole nightmare. Drama of the Lonely Hills. Again, I will quote from memory, seeking for a special reason to preserve as much of the flavor of the style as I can. It was postmarked, all those flaws in the signature, as well as the body of the letter was typed, as is frequent with beginners in typing. The text, though, was marvelously accurate for a typewriter's work, and I concluded that Cleve must have used a machine at some previous period, perhaps in college, to say that the letter relieved me would be only fair, yet beneath my relief lay a substantum of uneasiness. If Achilles had been sane in his terror, was he now sane in his deliverance and the sort of improved rapport mentioned? What was it? The entire thing implied such a diametrical reversal of Achilles' previous attitude. But here is the substance of the text, carefully transcribed from a memory in which I take some pride. Townsend, Vermont, Thursday, September 6, 1928. My dear Wilmar, it gives me great pleasure to be able to set at you at rest regarding all the silly things I've been writing you. I say silly. Although by that I mean my frightened attitude rather than my descriptions of certain phenomena. Those phenomena are real and important enough. My mistake had been in establishing an anomalous attitude toward them. I think I mentioned that my strange visitors were beginning to communicate with me and to attempt such communication. Last night this exchange of speech became actual. In response to certain signals I admitted to the house a messenger from those outside. A fellow human. Let me hasten to say, he told me much that neither you nor I had even begun to guess, and shewed clearly how totally we had misjudged and misinterpreted the purpose of the outer ones in maintaining their secret colony on this planet. It seems that the evil legends about what they have offered to men, and what they wish in connection with the earth, are wholly the result of an ignorant misconception of allegorical speech. Speech, of course, molded by cultural backgrounds and thought habits basically different from anything we dream of. My own conjectures I freely own shot as widely past the mark as any of the guesses of illiterate farmers and savage Indians. What I thought morbid and shameful and ignominious is in reality awesome and mind-expanding and even glorious. My previous estimate being merely a phase of man's eternal tendency to haste. No. Hate and fear and shrink from the utterly different. Now I regret the harm I have inflicted upon these alien incredible beings in the course of our nightly skirmishes. If only I had consented to talk peacefully and reasonably with them in the first place. But they bear me no grudge, their emotions being organized very differently from ours. It is their misfortune to have had, as their human agents in Vermont, some very inferior specimens. The late Walter Brown, for example. He prejudiced me vastly against him. Actually, they have never. Knowing the armed men would have often been cruelly wronged and spied upon by our species, there is a whole secret cult of evil men. A man of your mystical erudition will understand me when I link them with Hester and the yellow sign devoted to the purpose of tracking them down and injuring them on behalf of monstrous powers from other dimensions? It is against these aggressors, not against normal humanity, that the drastic precautions of the outer ones are directed. Incidentally, I learned that many of our lost letters were stolen not by the outer ones, but by the emissaries of the malign cult. All that the outer ones wish of man is peace and non-molestation and an increasing intellectual rapport. This latter is absolutely necessary now that our inventions and devices are expanding to our knowledge and emotions and making it more and more impossible for the outer ones necessary outposts to exist. Particularly on this planet, the alien beings desire to know mankind more fully and to have a few of mankind's philosophic and scientific leaders know more about them with such an exchange and science of knowledge, all perils will pass, and a satisfactory, modest, divine die be established. The very idea of any attempt to enslave or degrade mankind is just ridiculous. As the beginning of this improved report, the Outer Ones have naturally chosen me, whose knowledge of them is already so considerable as their primary interpreter on Earth. Much was told me last night, facts of the most dependence and vista opening nature, and more will be subsequently communicated to me, both orally and in writing. I shall not be called upon to make any trip outside just yet, though I shall probably wish to do so later on. Employing special means and transcending everything which we have hitherto been accustomed to regard as human experience, my house will be... The siege no longer. Everything has returned.
reverted to normal, and the dogs will have no further occupation. In place of terror, I have been given a rich boon of knowledge and intellectual adventure which few other mortals have ever shared. The whisper in darkness. The outer beings are perhaps the most marvelous organic things that were beyond all space and time. Members of a cosmos wide race of things which all other life forms are merely degenerate variants. They are more vegetable than animal. If these terms can be applied to the sort of matter composing them and have a somewhat fungoid structure, Though the presence of a chlorophyll-like substance in a very singular nutritive system system differentiate them altogether from true chlorophytic fungi. Indeed, the type is composed of a form of matter totally alien to our part of space, with electrons having a wholly different vibration rate. That is why the beings cannot be photographed on the ordinary camera films and plates of our known universe. And... Even though our eyes can see them, with proper knowledge, however, any good chemist could make a photographic emulsion which would record their images. The genus, the genus is unique in its ability to traverse the heatless and airless interstellar void in full corporeal form, and some of its variants cannot do this without mechanical aid or curious surgical transpositions. Only a few species have the ether-resisting wings characteristic of the Vermont. Variety. Variety, sorry. Those inhab inhabiting certain remote peaks in the old world were brought in other ways. Their external resemblance to animal life and to the sort of structure we understand as material is a matter of parallel evolution rather than of close kinship. Their brain capacity exceeds that of any other surviving life form, although the wing types of our hill country are by no means the most highly developed. Telepathy is their usual means of discourse, though they have rudimentary vocal organs which after a slight operation for a surgery is an incredibly expert and everyday thing among them, can roughly duplicate the speech of such types of organism as still use speech. Their main immediate abode is a still undiscovered and almost lightless planet at the very edge of our solar system, beyond Neptune and the ninth in distance from the sun. It is, as we have inferred, the object mystically hinted at. In certain ancient and forbidden writings, and it will soon be the scene of a strange focusing of thought upon our world in an effort to facilitate mental rapport, I would not be surprised if astronomers became sufficiently sensitive to these thought currents to discover Yogoth when the other ones wish them to do so. But Yogoth, of course, is only the stepping stone. The main body of the beings in habit is strangely organized. Abyss is wholly beyond the utmost reach of any human imagination. The space-time global which we recognize as the totality of all cosmic entity is only an atom in the genuine infinity which is theirs, and as much of this infinity as any human brain can hold is eventually to be opened up to me as it has been to not more than fifty other men since the human race has existed. You will probably call this raping at first, well, Marth, but in time you will appreciate the titanic opportunity I stumbled upon. I want you to share as much of it as possible, and to that end must tell you thousands of things that won't go on paper. In the past, I have warned you to not come see me. Now that all is safe, I'll take pleasure in rescinding that warning and inviting you. Can't you make a trip up here before your college term opens? It would be marvelously delightful if you could. Bring along the phonograph record and all my letters to you as consultative data. We shall need them in piecing together the whole tremendous story. You might bring the Kodak prints too, since I seem to have mislaid the negatives and my own prints in all this recent excitement. But what a wealth of facts I have to add to all this groping and tentative material, and what a stupendous device I have to supplement my additions. Don't hesitate. I am free from espionage now, and you will not meet anything unnatural or disturbing. Just come along and let my car meet you at the Brattleboro Station. Prepare to stay as long as you can, and expect many an evening of discussion of things beyond all human conjecture. Don't tell anyone about it, of course, for this matter must not get to the promiscuous public. The train service to Brattleboro is not bad. You can get a timetable in Boston, take the B&M to Greenfield, and then change for the brief remainder of the way. <clears throat> I suggest you're taking the convenient 4th MPM standard from Boston. This gets into Greenfield at 7.35. At 9.19, a train leaves there, which reaches Brattleboro at 10.01. That is a weekdays. Let me know the date, and I'll have my car on hand at the station. Pardon this type letter, but my handwriting has grown shaky of late, as you know, and I don't feel equal to long stretches of script. I got this now, Corona. 
<laughs> I got this new Corona and Bridal Pearl yesterday. It seems to work very well. Awaiting word. And hoping to see you shortly with the phonograph record and all my letters in the Kodak prints. I am yours in anticipation, Henry W. Keeley. Albert N. Wilmarth Esquire, Miskatonic University, Arkham, Massachusetts. The complexity of my emotions upon reading, rereading, and pondering over this strange and unlooked for letter is past adequate description. I have said that I was at once relieved and made uneasy, but this expresses only crudely the overtones of diverse and largely subconscious feelings which comprise both the relief and the uneasiness. To begin with, the thing was so antipodally at, at a variance with the whole chain of horrors preceding it. The change of mood from stark terror to full complacency and even the exaltation was so unheralded, lightning-like, and complete, I could scarcely believe that a single day could so alter the psychological perspective of one who had written the final frenzied bulletin of Wednesday, no matter what relieving disclosures that day might have brought. At certain moments, a sense of conflicting realities made me wonder whether this whole distantly important drama of fantastic forces were not a kind of <laughs> illusory dream created largely within my own mind. Then I thought of the phonograph record and gave me a way to still greater bewilderment. The later seemed so unlike anything which could have been expected to be the letter. As I analyzed my impression, I saw that it consisted of two distinct phases. First, granting that Akili had been sane before and was still sane, the indicated change in the situation was itself was so swift and unthinkable. And secondly, the change in Akili's own manner. Gratitude, attitude, and language was so vastly beyond the normal or the predictable. The man's whole personality seemed to have undergone an insidious mutation, a mutation so deep that one could scarcely reconcile the two aspects with the supposition that both represented equal sanity. <clears throat> Word choice, spelling, all were subtly different, and with my academic sensitiveness to prose style, I could phrase profound divergences in these common, most commonest reactions and rhythm responses. Certainly the emotional cataclysm or revelation which could produce so radical an overturn must be an extreme one indeed. Yet in another way, the letter seemed quite characteristic. Ah. Characteristic of Achilles, the same old passion for infancy, the same old entirely inquisitiveness. I could not a moment even understand or breathe. For more than a moment, credit the idea of spuriousness or malign substitution did not the invitation, the willingness to have me test the truth of the letter in person, prove its genuineness. I did not retire Saturday night. Instead of thinking of the shadows and marvels behind the letter I had received, my mind aching from the quick succession of monstrous conceptions that had been forced to confront during the last four months, worked upon this startling new material in a cycle of doubt and acceptance which repeated most of the steps experienced in facing the earlier wonders. Till long before dawn of burning interest and curiosity had begun to replace the original storm of veracity and uneasiness matters saying metamorphoso or merely relieved. The chances were that Achilles had actually encountered some stupendous change of perspective in his hazardous research, some change at once diminishing his danger, real or fancied, and opening dizzy new vistas of cosmic and superhuman knowledge, my own seal for the unknown flared up to me is, and I felt myself touched by the contagion of the morbid barrier breaking to shake off the maddening and wearying limitations of time and space and natural law, to be linked with the vast outside, to come close to the nighted and abysmal secrets of the infinite and the ultimate. Surely such a thing was worth the risk of one's life, soul, and sanity, and Achille had said there was no longer any peril. He had invited me, invited me to visit him instead of wearing me away as before. I think I would have thought of what he might now have to tell me. There was an almost paralyzing fascination in the thought of sitting in that lonely and lately beleaguered farmhouse with a man who had talked with actual mysteries from outer space, sitting there with a terrible record in the pile of letters in which Achille had summarized his earlier conclusions. So late Sunday morning, I telegraphed Achille that I would meet him in Brattleboro on the following Wednesday, September the 12th. 
if that day were convenient for him, if only one respect could I depart from his suggestions, and that concerned the choice of a train. Frankly, I did not feel like arriving in the honor from my region late at night, so instead of accepting the train he chose, I telephoned the station and devised another arrangement. I did that, you know, by rising early and taking the 8.07 a.m. standard into Boston. I could catch the 9.25 for Greenfield, arriving there at 12.22 noon. This connected exactly with the train reaching Brattleboro at 1.08 p.m., a much more comfortable hour than 10.01 for Maiden Akili, and riding with him into the closed back secret guarding hills. I mentioned this choice in my telegram, and was glad to learn in the reply which came toward evening that it had met with my prospective host's endorsement. His wire ran thus. Arrangement satisfactory. We'll meet 1.08 train Wednesday. Don't forget. Record and letters and prints keep destination quiet. Expect great revelations. Receipt of this message in direct response to one sent to Akili and necessarily delivered to his house from the town sending station at your by a special messenger or by a restored telephone service. Removed any lingering subconscious doubts I may have had about the authorship of the perplexing letter. Excuse me. My relief was marked. Indeed, it was greater than I could account for at that time. It was all such the out had been rather deeply buried, but I slept soundly and long that night and was equally busy with preparation during the ensuing two days. Covered bridges lingered fearsomely out of the past in pockets of the hills in the half-abandoned railway track paralleling the river seemed to exhale a nebulously visible air of desolation. There were also some sweeps of vivid valley where great cliffs rose. New England's virgin granite shooing gray and all steer through the verdure that scaled the crest. There were gorges where untamed streams leaped, bearing down toward the river the unimagined secrets of a thousand pathless peaks. Branching away now and then were narrow, half-concealed roads that bored their way through solid, luxuriant masses of forest among whose primal trees whole armies of elemental spirits might well work. As I saw these, I thought of how Achille had been molested by unseen agencies of his drives along this very route, and did not wonder that such things could be. The quaint, slightly village of New Fane, reached in less than an hour, was our last link with that world which man can definitely call his own by virtue of conquest and complete occupancy. After that, we cast off all allegiance to immediate, tangible, and time touched wings, and entered a fantastic world of hushed unreality in which the narrow ribbon like road rose and fell and curved with an almost sentient and purposeful caprice amongst the tenuous green peaks and half deserted valleys. Except for the sound of the motor and the faint stir of the few lonely farms we passed at infrequent intervals, the only thing that reached my ears was the gurgling and insidious trickle of strange waters from numberless hidden fountains in the shadowy woods. The nearness and intimacy of the dwarf doomed hills now became veritably breathtaking. Their steepness and abruptness were even greater than I had imagined from hearsay, and suggested nothing in common with the prosaic, objective world we know. The dense, unvisited woods on those inaccessible slopes seemed to harbor alien and incredible things, and I felt that the very outline of the hills themselves held some strange and eon forgotten meaning, as if they were vast hieroglyphs left by a rumored Titan race whose glories live only in rare, deep dreams, all the legends of the past, and all the stupefying imputations of Achilles' letters and exhibits blowed up in my memory to heighten the atmosphere of tension and growing nuisance. Sorry, menace. The purpose of my visit and the frightful abnormalities it postulated struck me all at once with a chill sensation that nearly overbalanced my ardor for strange delvings. My guide must have noticed my disturbed attitude, for as the road grew wilder and more irregular, and our motion Slower and more jolting, his occasional pleasant comments expanded into a steadier flow of discourse. He spoke of the beauty and weirdness of the country and revealed some acquaintance with the folklore studies of my prospective host. From his polite questions, it was obvious that he knew I had come for a scientific purpose and that I was bringing data of some importance. <clears throat> But he gave no sign of appreciating the depth and awfulness of the knowledge which Achille had finally reached. His manner was so cheerful, normal, and urbane that his remarks ought to have calmed and reassured me. But oddly enough, I felt only the more deserved as we bumped and veered onward into the unknown wilderness of hills and woods. At times it seemed as if we were pumping me to see what I knew of the monstrous secrets of the place, and with every fresh utterance that vague, 
teasing, baffling, familiarity in his voice increased. It was not an ordinary or healthy familiarity, despite me the thoroughly wholesome and cultivated nature of the voice. No, I somehow linked it with forgotten nightmares, the nightmares I didn't want to have, and felt that I might go mad if I recognized them. If any good excuse had existed, I think I would have turned back away from our visit, as it was I could not well do so when it occurred to me that a cool scientific conversation with Achille himself after my arrival would help greatly to pull me together. Besides, there was a strangely common element of cosmic beauty in the hype nautic landscape through which we climbed and plunged fantastically. Time had lost itself in the labyrinth behind, and around us stretched only the flowery waves of fairy and the recapture of the of vanished countries. The hoary groves, the untainted pastures, edged with gay autumnal blossoms, and at vast intervals the small brown farmsteads nestling amidst huge trees beneath vertical precipices of fragrant briar, briar and meadow grass. Even the sunlight assumed a supernal glamour as if some special atmosphere or, exa or oxidation mantled the whole region. I had seen nothing like it before, save in the magic vistas that sometimes form the backgrounds of Italian primitives. Sotama and Leonardo has conceived such expanses, but only in the distance and through the vaultings of Renaissance arcades. We were now firmly and bodily through the midst of the picture, and I seemed to find in this necromancy a thing I had innately known or inherited, for which I had always been vainly searching. Suddenly, after rounding an obtuse single at the top of a sharp ascent, the car came to a standstill. On my left, across the well kept lawn which stretched to the road and wanted a border of whitewashed stone, rose of white two and a half story house of unusual size and elegance for the region, with the contours of contiguous of arcade linked farmsteads and windmill behind and to the right, I recognized it at once from the snapshot I had received and was not surprised to see the name of Henry Keeley on the galvanized iron mailbox near the road. For some distance back at the house, a level stretch of marshy and sparsely wooded land extended, beyond which soared a steep, thickly forested hillside ending in a jagged, leafy crest. This ladder, I know, and knew, was the summit of Dark Mountain, halfway up which we must have climbed already. Alighting from the car and taking my valise, noise asked me to wait while he went in and notify Akili of my advent. He myself himself nodded at important business elsewhere and could not stop for more than a moment. As he briskly walked up the path to the house, I climbed out of the car myself, wishing to stretch my legs a little before settling down to a sedentary conversation. My feeling of nervousness and tension had risen to a maximum again now that I was on the actual scene of the morbid beleaguering described so hauntingly in Akili's letters, and I honestly dreaded the coming discussions which were to link me with such alien and forbidden worlds. Close contact with the utterly bizarre is often more terrifying than inspiring, and it did not cheer me to think that this very bit of dusty road was the place where those monstrous tracks in that boated green court had been found afternoon. Moonless nights of fear and death. Oddly, I noticed that none of Achilles' dogs seemed to be about. Had he sold them all? As soon as the outer ones made peace with him? Try as I might. I could not have the same confidence in the depth and sincerity of that pace which appeared in Achilles' final and queerly different letter. After all, he was a man of much simplicity and with little worldly experience. Was there not perhaps some deep and sinister undercurrent beneath the surface of the new alliance? Led by my thoughts, my eyes turned downward to the powdery road surface which had held such hideous testimonies. The last few days had been dry, and tracks of all sorts cluttered the rutted, <laughs> irregular highway, despite the unfrequented nature of the district. With a vague curiosity, I began to trace the outline of some of the heterogeneous impressions, trying meanwhile to curb the lights of macabre fancy which the place in its memories suggested. There was something menacing and uncomfortable in the funeral. <laughs> Stilliness, and the muffled, subtle trickle of a distant brooks in the crowding green peaks and black wooded precipices that choked the narrow horizon. And then an image shot into my consciousness which made those vague menaces and flights of fancy seem mild and insignificant indeed. I have said that I was scanning the miscellaneous prints in the road with a kind of vital curiosity, but all at once that curiosity was shockingly snuffed out by a sudden and paralyzing gust of acting terror.
it with my cat by excuse me. Wait, what? What the hell? Alright, I'm gonna finish this one tomorrow. I'm on the Whisper in Darkness. HP Lovecraft. Chapter 5. Book reading. I'll see y'all on Marvelous Monday. Peace. Stay positive.